Hello, all. It's me, Michael Anthony Judasissi. Welcome to All Things Billy, the podcast for a big John Miller episode. And if you don't know who John Miller is, well, we'll do our best to uh, <laughs> to fill you in on that. Uh, today's episode will rely heavily on the book Resurrecting the Dead by I guess I can't call him my friend. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't think he would consider himself my friend, but I'm, uh, 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 an associate, uh, somebody I know, somebody I've talked to, worked with a little bit, uh, Doctor Dale Tunnell. And uh, <clears throat> I'm reading Dale's. First of all, the book is available on Amazon, "Resurrecting the Dead," and then the uh, the subtitle is "We Now Know More About Billy the Kid, the Person Than the Legends Than the Legend." And uh, here is the about the author section. Dr. Dale Tunnell was born in Powell, Wyoming, 1951. He is a decorated Vietnam veteran, married, now living a retired lifestyle in Phoenix, Arizona. Trained in psycholinguistics and psychological content analysis, Dale is a retired law enforcement officer with over 40 years of service with federal, state, and local agencies. He earned his Master of Arts degree in Management from Webster University and his Doctor of Philosophy degree in Psychology from Capella University. Dale received beginning, advanced, and stage two training in Scientific Content Analysis, which would be, uh, the acronym would be SCAN, from Avinom Sapir at the Laboratory for Scientific Interrogation in Phoenix, Arizona, and for a brief period was an instructor for LSI. He also mentored under Louis Gottschalk, MD, PhD at the University of California at Irvine, where he acquired his expertise in psychiatric content analysis and diagnosis. Dale served as senior researcher for Nemesisco Limited, Netanyah Israel, and is recognized internationally as an expert in layered voice analysis. He is also the director of forensic intelligence and research with Halcyon Group International. Dale's interest in the American West began in 1976 when he first worked as a deputy sheriff in Lincoln County, New Mexico. There you go. There's the tie-in. He's an author and active member of the American Psychological Association and the Linguistic Society of America. Now that is some CV. Um, <laughs> mine by comparison is a, a thumbnail sketch. But uh, I have uh, talked with, spoken with, communicated with, worked a little bit with Dr. Dale Tunnell. And um, the guy uh, knows his stuff and is really a very disciplined uh, researcher. Uh, I did let him know that I wanted to do this episode and rely heavily on his book, which I read uh, a year and a half, two years ago. And he said, fine. Uh, he was not interested in being a part of it. I think he's moved on to other projects. And so, uh, as noted, a lot of the information from today's talk is going to come from that book, but I highly suggest you get it because it's not just about John Miller. In fact, the John Miller piece is uh, relatively small, but it does talk about uh, Billy the Kid. It talks about a number of the discrepancies in the story of his death um, and uh, uncovers a lot of forensic psychological evidence that you may find fascinating derived from Billy's letters and his situations. So pretty cool book. So we're going to get right into the uh, story of uh, John Miller. Was he or was he not Billy the Kid? And we're going to do that right after this. All right. The first thing to talk about with John Miller is that uh, Miller's remains were exhumed back in 2005, May 19th, 2005. And uh, Steve Cedarwall, who many of you know or know of, as well as Dr. Dale Tunnell were present. Now, if you listen to <laughs> varying stories, you'll, uh, you'll hear, hey, we weren't, we didn't do it. We were just there to, uh, we were invited to witness it. This, the state of Arizona did it. Um, here is Dr. Tunnell's uh, statement on that. What we expected 
to be a low key effort turned out to be a media event with the presence of about 30 or more observers, including Cedar Wallace Sheriff Sullivan, that's uh, Lincoln County Sheriff Tom Sullivan, and me. In a book previously authored by Cedar Wall, he referenced Miller's exhumation, stating that, quote, the state of Arizona, state of Arizona exhumed him, end quote. I can say without a doubt that the state of Arizona played no part in the excavation efforts, except that we received permission from a subdivision of the state government. The exhumation was petitioned by, uh, according to this book, Jeannie Dyke, director of the Pioneer Home, because Miller had no next of kin that could uh, request it. Um, so the section B of the statute for uh, exhumation or reinterment uh, said, negated the need for a permit or quarter since approval could be granted by the owners of the cemetery. So if there's no family member around, then the owners of the cemetery can determine that this is Arizona law can determine uh, that they want to exhume the grave. And that's the uh, statute by which this grave was exhumed. Uh, again, from the book, uh, like all of us who participated in the exhumation, she was interested in determining if John Miller was in fact, Billy the kid. If so, she intended to move his remains to a more prominent location within the cemetery and change records to reflect John Miller's identity. Our attorney performed a legal review of the statute and determined that Ms. Dyke's actions constituted internal management of the cemetery. And that's it. So uh, on the up and up, it was done according to Arizona state law. <clears throat> now you might be saying, hey, wait a minute. There's no documented uh, relatives of Billy Bonnie, and the village of Fort Sumner owns the land that the cemetery is on, they could do the exact same thing. That's New Mexico law, and I don't know the difference between Arizona and New Mexico law. And also, there are people, a number of people that claim to be relatives of William H. Bonney. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, and you would have to prove that. So if you wanted to have an exhumation and you were a relative of uh, Billy Bonney, then you would have to prove that you were a relative in a court of law, which would be hard to do without DNA. Uh, and if you uh, were, if you said you were a relative and you went to court and were proven not to be, well, then you would not be able to do that. So it's uh, not quite as as easy as you think it might be to just exhume a grave. And probably rightly so. Otherwise, we might be digging up people all over the country just for whim and whimsy. Hey, I wonder what they, you know, what this guy wore when they buried him, or I wonder what size his feet were, or something like that. Uh, so to uh, to do it, uh, it demands, you know, legal knowledge and understanding and the proper permits, authority, et cetera. And as you'll see, even then, uh, these guys were, uh, were threatened with uh, some pretty significant felony charges after the exhumation of Miller. Now, I am not going to talk about that anymore because that's not the focus of this talk, but I would suggest that you get Dr. Tennell's book if you want more information on the exhumation. I give you that only as background for what comes next. And what comes next is coming up right now. The real question is, where did the story of John Miller come from? Like who, who even determined that John Miller could have been Billy the Kid? And the first uh, known writing about John Miller, potentially being Billy the Kid, was a book called Encounter with the Frontier, written by Gary Teachin in 1969. And uh, Dr. Tunnell recounts that he has uh, had spoken with Gary Teachin a number of times and obviously read the book. And his opinion is that that book was the uh, the spawning ground for the more famous book by Helen Airy, which was published in 1993, titled Whatever Happened to Billy the Kid? Um, you know, comparing the two texts, there's a lot of similarities. A lot of the anecdotes and recollections are the same. And uh, so you might assume that a lot of one book came from another, which is not necessarily bad as long as you attribute it 
but you need to be able to look at the sources for the first book before you uh, make them sources for the second book. Now, on uh, I've pulled this up because I've seen this a number of times before. When you look at the book, Whatever Happened to Billy the Kid on Amazon, here's the blurb. It's possible that Billy the Kid escaped the gunfire from Pat Garrett's pistol. And under the name of John Miller, he could have lived the rest of his life as a cattle rancher and horse breeder in the Zuni Mountains of western New Mexico and as a farm worker in Buckeye, Arizona. His adopted son, Max Miller, said so. So do most of the Indians and the Mormon pioneers who knew John Miller. Could this be? Our book presents some convincing evidence. You decide. So that's very far from a declaration of, hey, this proves this guy is Billy the Kid. And that's good because the book is very, very short on uh, documented facts and long on, uh, you know, second, uh, secondhand anecdotes and recollections. Um, I've read it. This was one of the first Billy the Kid books that I ever read. When you look at the pictures of John Miller, you want to go, hey, wait a minute, this guy could actually be uh, Billy the Kid. So yeah, sure, we should... Uh, we should take a look at this uh, and uh, pay attention to it. Uh, the reviews, uh, five-star reviews, 67%, 4.4 out of five stars, the overall reviews. So um, yeah, you can uh, you can read it. it. It certainly doesn't, it's not a book you're going to read and come away going, that book proved to me that John Miller is Billy the Kid. It's a book you would probably read and come away going, okay, maybe. Maybe it's the book itself, this blurb, which is not very well written, by the way. Uh, and I know a lot of things that I write are not very well written. You don't start a sentence with and, and the one sentence runs on for like four different ideas. But it says, could this be? In other words, could all this stuff I just said be? Our book presents some convincing evidence you decide. So Helen Airy, I think, wrote this from the standpoint of, hey, it's an interesting story. And... Uh, you know, there's a chance that maybe he was Billy the Kid, and if he's not, well, still a cool story. Um, so there, that's the uh, that's the background of Helen Airy's book, and that's the book that really launched John Miller's name into the, uh, you know, common lexicon of Billy the Kid files everywhere. Uh, so there you go. Now I will give you a spoiler on my film, The Final Trial of Billy the Kid. Uh, because for those of you that have not seen it, uh, I, I don't promise any big, uh, or I promise uh, no big reveals, but here's one reveal. In the first 10 minutes of the film, with John Miller being one of the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, I don't know what you call him, <laughs> one of those that charged Pat Garrett lied and that he was actually Billy the Kid, in the first 10 minutes, his his attorney withdraws his application or petition to be heard by the court. And leaves, asks to be recused, and that's it. And there's no more John Miller in the film. Why is that, you might ask? Well, it goes back to what I may have, what I talked about in a uh, another episode where I gave you some background on the film, where I asked the John Miller experts, a couple of them, to take part in a real trial, and one of them was Dr. Dale Tunnell. And he was the one that said to me, nope, not interested. And I said, okay, why? And he said, because there's not a single shred of evidence, Michael, that I could present in a court of law that would prove that John Miller is Billy the Kid. There's nothing. Now, if you watch the film, you'll see that, uh, and this, I have to uh, uh, give this credit to Daniel Grahofsky, who's an, an actor who was in initially signed to play Miller's attorney. And he had a conflict when we changed our filming dates. And he said, Michael, I really would love to get this in the script. Yes, I'm, re I'm asking to be recused, but I also haven't found anything that prevented John Miller from being Billy the Kid. And that is also true, kind of. In other words, there's nothing that says, hey, John Miller was here in 1878 and here was Minnesota or Mexico or England. You can't track him and say he was somewhere else so he couldn't be Billy the Kid. 
He really did seem to walk into history in Las Vegas in August 1878. But we we will have a conclusion near the end here. But there is not, again, according to Dr. Tanell, and he's a guy that would know, there's not a single piece of tangible, admittable evidence in a court of law that could prove that this guy was Billy the Kid. You can't make a case. And so, uh, you know, from the standpoint of making a film, I thought, okay, well, what's the best? Do we have this guy walk in and go, eh, I'm leaving? Uh, or do we find some other vehicle to dismiss him and make it known that he doesn't have a case? And so I went as the screenwriter, I decided to do that by not having, not even having him show up at court and having his attorney speak on his behalf and then hurry out of the room. So there you go. That's your little spoiler for the film. But if you want to see the rest of it, go to Amazon, The Final Trial of Billy the Kid. All right. Uh, so Helen Airy interviewed some people uh, from the Rama area, and there's a number of date discrepancies. How, when was uh, Miller uh, there with Isadora? When did they leave? How long were they there? So you got to have, if you're going to publish this book in 93 and you're going to talk in the early 90s to these people, I mean, they're pretty old. And uh, she, Helen Airy, for the most part, printed what she was told, which is a, a testament to a good um, a good author, a good historical book author, in that you don't say what you think it means, which is something that many other historical authors in this space could <laughs> uh, could learn from. You just say what the people said and allow the uh, the reader to determine what that means. Okay. Uh, so the book comes out in 93. It becomes somewhat well-known. And the uh, the story of John Miller starts to spread nowhere near the story of Brushy Bill Roberts. I have recounted this, I think, in the past, but I did a poll in one of the Billy the Kid Facebook groups that has, you know, thousands and thousands of members. And there were over 200 responses. This was a year and a half ago. Uh, and Roughly 60% of the people believe that Pat Garrett told the truth. Roughly 30% of the people believe Brushy Bill was Billy the Kid. And then the, of the remaining 10%, about 6 or 7%, can't remember the exact number, were people that believed in the John Miller story. And that's probably a testament of two things. First of all, that Garrett and Brushy Bill have had a lot longer time to tell their story. And second of all, there's very uh, little known about Miller. And so it's one of those things where you go, mm, maybe, could be, but I, you know, I need more proof. And I don't believe that any more proof is forthcoming. So we're going to jump into the uh, life or what we know of John Miller uh, right after this. So what is the story of John Miller? In other words, uh, ha, you know, what is his story of what happened in Fort Sumner? This is uh, the very first area where the story is rather problematic because whether you're a believer in Brushy Bill or Pat Garrett, it's very well uh, documented and believed that on July 14, 1881, something happened in Fort Sumner, some sort of gunfight, somebody was shot, somebody was killed. But uh, the in Helen Airy's book, uh, her description says, Isidore, this is a quote, Isidore later told friends and neighbors that some days before the shootout at Pete Maxwell's house, the kid had been wounded and that she had taken him to her home in Fort Sumner. She tended to his wounds and hid him between two straw mattresses, which she slid under the bed when officers came looking for him. When he was well enough to travel, the couple fled Fort Sumner and headed toward the village of Las Vegas, where there were friends to help them, end quote. That's directly from Helen Airy's book. Now, first of all, this is uh, Helen Airy, uh, rather Isadora Miller was not interviewed. She died in 1936. So this is somebody else. And this is kind of a summation of she later told friends and neighbors 
some of which may have told Helen Airy or relatives of some of which may have told Helen Airy. So it is, you know, a, at least a couple layers of hearsay and would be inadmissible in a court. But the biggest problem with that is uh, some days before the shooting on July 14th, the shootout. Well, if Miller is shot by, uh, and, and she intimates she, that he is shot by the same people that come searching on the 14th, um, that some days before that, that there's a shootout and Miller's wounded, and Miller being Billy the Kid in her estimation, um, then why would there be a shootout on the 14th? They've already shot Billy and there's nobody else to shoot because they can't find him. They obviously don't find him on the 14th because he's hiding between two straw mattresses that Isadora hid under the bed. Every single other account of people that were there that attended the funeral, that uh, people that believe in Brushy Bill's story is that there was a shootout. It was either two bullets or a furious fusillade of uh, shots fired between the deputies, Garrett, uh, and Brushy Bill, but nobody says, oh, it was a quiet night in Fort Sumner and nothing happened, except Helen Airy says that. So it strains the credibility of every other eyewitness testimony that there was nothing that happened. And so the other part of this, obviously, is that now the kid is wounded, so let's let's backtrack um, eight days, seven to uh, seven to eight days before July 14th. And uh, the uh, after he recovers a month later, then they finally leave for Las Vegas. So about July 7th is based on this book, based on Helen Airy's book, about July 7th is when John Miller or Billy the Kid is shot by the sheriff's posse, but he escapes or he's found and hidden and taken in by Isadora Miller in Fort Sumner. And there's no record of Isadora, anybody being a resident of Fort Sumner, but we'll get back to that. There's a problem in that during that time, Pat Garrett and his posse are in Lincoln and White Oaks I mean, documented in their testimony that that's where they're looking for the kid or Garrett is, you know, sitting on his butt, you know, waiting to mount an effort to find the kid. Yet Isadora insinuates that the people that shot him came back looking for Billy a week later and couldn't find him because he was hiding between the mattresses. So there isn't really any other testimony that would point to the fact that there was this shootout on July the 8th or 7th and that Garrett's posse would have hung around Fort Sumner searching or ridden all the way back to Lincoln and then come back to Fort Sumner, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? You shoot somebody, you can't find him, so you leave and then come back a week later. I think if you're hunting the most wanted man in the territory, most likely you shoot somebody or you think you shot somebody and you keep searching until you find him. And you probably look between two mattresses that are hidden under a bed. Like that's probably a good place to hide somebody. You don't look in a, uh, you know, inside the tea kettle because you can't, you can't fit a body in there, but you can fit a body under a bed. And I've got to imagine that Garrett had enough legal or law enforcement prowess to go, Hey, what's under that bed? So very, the, the origin story, very, very sketchy does not line up at all with you know what we believe to be documented facts by a number of people even the brushy bill folks believe that there was a gunfight in fort sumner on july 14th 1881. there's no uh there's no testimony from john or isadora miller they never talked about it, it it's it's somebody later saying that isadora said something Right. There's no documented statements. Nobody interviewed her. Nobody wrote her recollections down at the time. It's just somebody a generation removed later on that said, oh, Isadora told me this. So that's really problematic. Um, and uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't push the, the narrative or the story forward anymore. It could have come 
the uh, the Millers had a son, Max Miller, adopted uh, Native American boy, um, who was alive. He might still be alive. I, I've tried to find the Millers on the uh, uh, the Navajo Nation reservation through some friends and have not been able to locate anyone. But I don't know if Max Miller is still alive. I don't believe he is, but but he could be. And if he is, hey Max. Um, but he may have uh, talked to Helen Airy. And he may have told her that story that, hey, his, you know, his mother said this or told him that. And it was, it's widely believed that Max Miller believed his father was Billy the Kid. But uh, we don't have, you know, Helen Aries, there's no notes, right? There's no um, footnotes. There's no uh, big uh, pile of research paperwork that, that she left for others to study. Um, there were some interviews, but there's very scant evidence to go along with the story. And again, when you read the blurb that, uh, that uh, is designed to sell the book, it really says, hey, this could have happened. What do you think? And I think that that's uh, an interesting way to do it. Um, okay, so uh, John Miller uh, and Isadora leave Fort Sumner sometime early August. And they make their way to Las Vegas. Uh, again, all of these are allegedly said because there's no direct testimony. These just come from Helen Airy's book. Uh, Isadora says that they are married by a parish priest named Father Barrera in the village of Las Vegas. Um, it, you, if you uh, look as um, as Dr. Tunnell did, at the church records, Santa Fe Archdiocese, New Mexico, there is no Father Barrera anywhere in the Archdiocese at that time, August 1878. There's a Father Herrera, parish priest in the village of Pecos, uh, but no marriage records for John and Isadora exist. And the records go from 1881 through 1916 for both the Santa Fe and Gallup Archdiocese. Now, that doesn't mean that they weren't married. It doesn't marry, mean that they weren't married by, uh, uh, whoops, wait a minute, gosh darn it, <laughs> that was not good, <clears throat> changed the wrong page there. It doesn't mean that they were not married by a father Barrera, but father Barrera would absolutely be a, uh, um, you know, a, a member of the archdiocese. If you're a father, that's a Catholic church uh, uh, inference. So, no Father Barrera, no uh, record of any wedding there. Interesting. The The popular story is that you know, this couple showed up, uh, you know, an Anglo guy with a fresh gunshot wound in his shoulder and a big gun on his hip, and he was very weak, and they got married and off they went. But nothing really, uh, nothing really to, uh, to confirm that. The other thing is uh, the story that John, uh, or, uh, of John Miller is that there was uh, this agreement with Jesus Riacho and that, um, th you know, Miller would tend to his cattle and the, the calves that were born would be split. And so after five years, the herd would be doubled and Miller would have his own herd of cattle that he had a part in raising. There's actually a recorded document between John Miller and Jesus Ariacho. I mean, John Miller was a real guy, certainly. And it spelled out the terms of that agreement. Um, and the, it, it, Dr. Tunnell points out that maybe there was another agreement, maybe not, but this one is documented, it exists, and it spells out those terms almost exactly as uh, they were stated. Ariacho agrees one bull, 12 steers, 37 cows to Miller in exchange for Miller's ranch property in $1. Miller promised to care for the cattle at his expense and pay taxes for five years at the expiration of the contract. Miller delivers 100 head of healthy animals to include two bills, 24 steers, 74 cows that are one to five years old. And, uh, Miller gets the rest. 
So the initial one bull and 12 steers, 37 and 13 is 50. So uh, Miller gets 50 cattle and um, in five years, he has to deliver a hundred and he keeps the ones that are left over. So that's cool. That part of the story seems correct, except there's a little problem that the deal is dated November 1, 1909. That's the actual contract. And that's 18 years after the Millers were supposed to have arrived in Rama. And the the Helen Airy story says, no, they went there, they cut this deal right away. And this is kind of how Miller got his start, you know, as, as uh, uh, you know, building his cattle herd and making some money. But the deal itself didn't happen for 18 years. So how do you account for all that time between 1881, when supposedly they got married and went right to Rama and 1909? So kernel of truth, or more than a kernel of truth, but a timeline that's really problematic. Anyway, uh, so we uh, we have a lot of questions. By this point, you go, okay, or at least I go, there's a lot of pieces that don't fit, and you really got to mash them together to try to make this guy into Billy the Kid. He says there was no shootout, or Isidora says second, third hand, that there was a shootout on July 14th, but that was after the other shootout, and we don't even know who the second shootout was with since Miller was wounded and lying under a bed between two mattresses. But anyway, and then they go to Las Vegas and get married by a parish priest that doesn't exist, but then they take their cows and their, their belongings, they move to Rama, New Mexico. And they cut this deal with Jesus Ariacho to, uh, you know, take care of his cattle and then, uh, you know, keep the remaining ones for their own herd and kind of get their start. But that agreement doesn't happen for 18 years after they supposedly arrived there. The story is splintering already, but these people existed. I mean, we absolutely know that John Miller and Isadora Miller existed. So who were they and how did they come about? And we will tackle that right after this. All right, we're back. <clears throat> so a uh, couple other facts that fly in the face of uh, what the Millers purportedly said. Um, the uh, U.S. Census of 1900 find uh, John Miller and Isadora. Uh, and, and when they find them, they say they were married in 1886. And the married, they've been married for 14 years, not 1881, but 1886. Now, their, their uh, places of uh, residence and their age does jump around in further censuses, sensei, <laughs> whatever that would be called. But uh, so maybe they were intentionally trying to hide something, and that could be one reason to do that. Uh, but they are always consistent about the year that uh, their son, Max, was adopted, Navajo's son, Max, and that he was about two years old when they took him in. Um, so how does the 1886 thing factor into the 1881 gunfight? I don't know. That's up for you to uh, determine. Um, Herman Tecklenburg was interviewed uh, as a uh, proof that John Miller was Billy the Kid. And uh, Tecklenburg says that he knew John Miller during his outlaw days in Fort Sumner in Oklahoma, and that uh, and that he was Billy the Kid, obviously. Uh, he knew John Miller when he was working as a cowboy around Fort Sumner, and that when he knew him, when, when Tecklenburg knew Miller or Bonnie, whatever you want to call him, that he was on the run from Pat Garrett looking to avoid him. Um, it looks like Tecklenburg would have been somewhere between 14 and 16 years old at the time Billy was on the run. So it could have been that he was out on his own, uh, but um, but challenging. But if you look in the uh, county records or census records in Lincoln or San Miguel counties, there is no Tecklenburg family. So 
this guy had to be on his own at 14, 15, 16 years old, which would not be totally unusual back then. Um, and have, you know, no place of residence, um, where, you know, he was near, his family would have had to be somewhere else. Um, the next uh, interview came from Eugene Lamson. Now Lamson, uh, thought that John Miller was Billy the Kid, and he was uh, just three years old when he and his family moved to Rama, New Mexico. Um, but of course, he was there for a while and stayed there for quite a while. Um, talks about uh, going up to Miller's house, having, having him tell stories about gunfights, uh, having Miller say he wasn't Billy the Kid, but he knew a lot about him, blah, blah, blah. Miller um, told Lamson, according to Lamson, that Isadora and Max had gone to, uh, made a trip to El Paso for supplies um, one night when they went up there and and Isadora and Max were not there, which, okay, could be, but uh, 700 mile round trip to El Paso for supplies or go to Albuquerque, which is, uh, I don't know, 150 miles. Uh, it just, it seems like a really long way to go for a woman and her young baby or son to go for supplies when there were places that were much, much closer. But who knows? Um, uh, Lamson and his family leave Rama in 1935, but return in 45 to open a malt and a sandwich shop. I love chocolate malts, by the way. If you want to, <laughs> I don't think you can send me one, but that would be probably my favorite dessert would be a chocolate malt with like extra malt stuff in there. So, um, Eugene Lance Lampson, I hope you made a good one. Uh, he returns in 45 to open this shop. And then he says, Lampson does, one day a stranger from Phoenix, Arizona walked into the malt shop. He was looking for an heir to John Miller's estate. He told me John Miller had died in Buckeye, Arizona. And since no one there knew of any survivors, the court appointed three men to go through his effects. But the man said he was one of the persons so appointed and when they searched through the contents of an old truck, they found documents, letters, and other items which convinced them John Miller was Billy the Kid. Um, okay. So th that is 1945. Miller died in 37. What happened for the previous eight years? Would a, uh, uh, would a court have men working on this for eight years to find a guy, you know, who, who had almost no possessions. That's kind of the reason he had to move into the Arizona pioneers rest home. And in fact, there's no documentation of any possessions he had at his death, but, uh, really three people to go through what was essentially zero possessions and spend eight years trying to track down people who would know him. Now, you might say, well, if if what was in that trunk proved he was Billy the Kid, then of course they would stay on it for eight years. Or, or, or <laughs> you would turn it over to other authorities who would go, oh my gosh, we found Billy the Kid. Let's launch an investigation here. I don't, maybe you would, but in my mind, you wouldn't spend eight years looking for somebody to tell the secret to if you were a court appointed um uh, a researcher or a probate uh, official. So it just doesn't make that much sense. Uh, when the uh, Millers lived in Buckeye, Arizona, uh, Carl Baxter uh, describes the events of the fire that killed Isadora Miller. And this is important because when you look at the timeline, especially, hey, there's this trunk with this stuff in it. Here's what Baxter said. And, and Ari infers that she interviewed him. Baxter said when the Miller house caught fire, young Carl Baxter helped carry Isadora's body from the burning building. She was a corpse, Baxter, Baxter said, she, but she wasn't burned. Baxter thinks she may have died before the fire started. His account is questionable since Isadora's death certificate says otherwise. The death certificate for Isadora Miller, October 18, 1936, from the attending physician stated, I saw the burned and charred body and believe from witnesses at hand 
that said the body was that of Dora Miller who burned to death when her house burned. Now here's, here's the part that gets interesting in this, in this uh, uh, interview. Baxter added that he remembered the old humpback trunk next to the Miller fireplace covered with an Indian blanket. Baxter said, you had to be very close to Miller to get near the trunk. Miller kept his guns in there and some photographs, keepsakes, and papers. He showed me a pistol with 21 notches. Let's stop right there. Okay, this is probably where Walter Burns Noble uh, uh, folklore enters the the uh, story, 21 notches. Okay, we know that Billy the Kid did not kill 21 men. And if he did, he, he killed uh, at least 12 or 13 of them uh, away from the eyes of anyone who would ever report it. So that's weird. And that's clearly, at least in my mind, uh, a, a nod to the fact that uh, a lot of this is made up. Uh, back into, showed me a pistol with 21 notches, some ammunition, old cartridges, a buffalo gun, pictures, and a slug he dug out of his body with a pocket knife. And this is important to listen to. And he showed me a ceramic jar with a lid on it that he kept in the bottom of the trunk that was filled with gold and silver coins. Okay. So in this trunk, the, the famous trunk that, you know, everybody wants to find, there was a gun with 21 notches. I think that's bullshit. Um, there's some ammunition, cartridges, buffalo gun. Um, how do you fit a buffalo gun in a trunk? I mean, I'm not a buffalo hunter, but those were those big, long, powerful, um, uh, not Springfields. I can't remember the name of the guns, but yeah, I mean, you were, you were firing from a long way away and you had to be very accurate to take down a buffalo. How does that fit in a trunk? Does it come in pieces? I don't think so. How big is this trunk? I mean, the trunk has to be as big as a canoe. Okay, but anyway. And the ceramic jar with gold and silver coins. Now, here's the part to pay attention to. Baxter said, after the fire, I was helping to clean up the burned building, and we found a patch of melted gold coins on the floor where the old trunk stood, about half a teacup full of melted gold, end quote. After the fire, the gold that was inside the ceramic jar that was inside the trunk is found melted on the floor. That's a hell of a fire, and it certainly could happen. Uh, but how is it possible that a ceramic jar disintegrated or and, and the gold itself melted to the floor and the trunk survived? The answer is it's not possible. It's not possible. And the entirety of this whole idea that there's this trunk, which I, I believe me, I, I, want it, I want it to be true. I've made inquiries into the trunk. Dr. Tunnell has searched for years for that thing. But if you're going to believe that this guy who was right there, uh, you know, a neighbor uh, and a friend of Miller's that helped, you know, carry Isadora's body out, if you're going to believe what he said, then you have to believe the trunk is gone. And so nobody is running around for eight years afterwards at a, to, to a malt shop to say, hey, what's in this trunk is proves that this guy was Billy the Kid. It's just strange, any strains, any sort of logic you could possibly have to put those things together and agree that both of them are correct. I do wonder if the researcher got a sandwich and a malt. Like what kind of sandwich would you get if you were, if you had proof that the guy that you were responsible for distributing his possessions was Billy the Kid? And you went back to Rama and there was a sandwich and malt shop. What would you get? I think I would get a, I mean, there's like, you know, the, the, <laughs> the options were probably more limited. I would love to have a Reuben. I think that would be great. So corned beef is, is a Reuben. Is that what I'm thinking of? Corned beef, uh, sauerkraut, a uh, thousand Island dressing toasted, is there some cheese, Swiss cheese on there and a chocolate malt? I would like a Reuben and a chocolate malt. No fries, no onion rings, no nothing like that. That's exactly what I would like to have. How about you? <laughs> Again, going for the 
ham and cheese or turkey sandwich. Like, I don't think that they had a, you know, skinny turkey sandwich with avocado and mixed spring greens organically grown. I, I, I think in 1945, that stuff was not uh, considered <laughs> at the time. Uh, but hey, I, I wasn't there. I don't know. All right. So we've got some huge problems with the John Miller story already. Now, I want to refer back to the fact that you're not going to find anything that says that John Miller was uh, absolutely, uh, that disproves him from being Billy the Kid, where he was seen, incarcerated, you know, sworn under oath that he was somewhere else or someone else. You're just not going to find that. John Miller, whoever he was, whether he was Billy the Kid or not, did a really good job of hiding himself up until he showed up somewhere in Las Vegas to be married, although even that is in question. And so we will uh, talk more about that after this. Okay, we're back. Uh, for uh, kind of the last word on Miller's possessions, any possessions, uh, it's important to uh, follow the uh, the trail after the fire which killed Isadora Miller. Undoubtedly, she did die in that fire. Uh, Miller goes to Prescott, Arizona to live in the uh, Pioneers, Pioneers and Miners rest home. Um, and he's there for about a year. At the time of his death, according to their records, he has no possessions. Uh, directly from Dr. Tunnell's book, an extensive search of the Phoenix probate court archives reveals no records of any property belonging to John Miller of Liberty or Prescott, Arizona. The same was true of any files in Yavapai County and the archives at the Arizona State uh, at Arizona State University turn up nothing. There's zero records of any property belonging to John Miller existing. And John Miller was in a legitimate facility. He didn't die out on the range somewhere. He wasn't shot in Pete Maxwell's bedroom, you know, and, uh, and, you know, with all the speculation, he died in the Arizona Pioneers Rest Home, which still exists to this day. They would be required to write out a report about the death of one of their residents. But there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Now, I've already pointed out that if the trunk existed and people said, oh, my gosh, this proves this guy was Billy the Kid, why did nobody hear about it? How come no one took it to the press? Nobody said uh, anything. Uh, so, <laughs> again, it's, it just kind of strains, strains credibility. But here's the way it should have happened. Let's say somebody found the trunk, and that trunk probably would have been at the Pioneer's Rest Home, but maybe it was somewhere else. And they said, oh, this is John Miller's. It needs to get to his next of kin. It would have been turned over to the Maricopa County Sheriff for disposal as found property, not the probate court. Hey, this isn't mine. This belongs to somebody else. Give it to the sheriff. You don't go to the probate court because if you find the trunk, you don't know if the guy's dead or alive. Uh, if the trunk did end up with the probate court, uh, which probably would not have, uh, the minimum value of the chest and what was in it would have to be $2,500 for the probate court to assign somebody you know, to, to work on that. <clears throat> and then for the court to take action, if it met all those thresholds, somebody would have to sign a petition. They place a uh, notice in the local newspaper to heirs of the John Miller state to come forward. Uh, if they located an heir, they would have instructed them via return letter how to file a claim and appear before the court to take possession. I mean, there would be a lot of documentation for this, and there's none. There's this mystery trunk that somehow had existed when uh, Helen Airy wrote her book that somehow proved that John Miller was Billy the Kid. And I've heard from from uh, people, you know, that have credibility. Oh, the gun was found in the trunk and sold to a collector in Canada. Uh, okay, but there's no trunk. So how was a gun found in the trunk? And where's the collector? And where's the gun? And where's the notches? That stuff is very quickly overlooked. 
Uh, uh, Dr. Tanel says, and he's, he's relayed this to me personally in conversations, he searched for the trunk himself. Uh, he was told by people who knew Max Miller that uh, that Max got the trunk. Although when he was interviewed, Max was interviewed by Helen Airy. He said he didn't know anything about it. Uh, supposedly handed down through his family, and it's somewhere on the Navajo uh, Nation Reservation. I know that as recently as two or three years ago, uh, I think it was two or three years ago, maybe four, uh, that uh, there were still, you know, leads coming in, but they were always very sketchy. Yes, I know where the trunk is, Dr. Tunnell, uh, but I'm going to talk to the guy and then he's going to talk to somebody else and we're going to, and we'll get back to you. And then nobody ever got back, you know, very suspicious. And then uh, the, uh, you know, then the trunk would wind up somewhere. Oh, no, it's not there. It's here. It's there. It's, it's like a shell game. You know, I'm going to keep moving it around until, and, and if the, if the goal was money, nobody ever asked for money. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. If some, now, of course, if you, <laughs> I guess you could dummy up a trunk and put some old documents in it and, uh, and, and ask for a million dollars for it, but no one ever, even ever asked for money, just kept moving from place to place. I think somebody was, was having some fun. Okay. So. That's what we're left with when we talk about the uh, we talk about the, the the famous trunk about Isidore Miller about John Miller, but then the the question is, well, who were they? And there are some uh, theories as to who at least Isidora Miller was. The uh, death certificate for Isadora disclosed an important piece of information that overall had been overlooked. <clears throat> it disclosed her birthplace, her father's name, her mother's name, and where they were born. And now John Miller provided this information. He listed her place of birth as Las Vegas, New Mexico, which seems legitimate. And her father's name as Size, S-I-S-E. And that's, uh, that would be, or that could be, I'm not saying it is, but that could be the way an Anglo would spell the more uh, uh, popular Hispanic surname of Size, S-A-I-S or S-A-I-Z, which I see quite a bit. So, you know, did John Miller just spell it wrong since he, you know, didn't speak or uh, uh, or write in Spanish? Because there's no record of a size S I S E family in Las Vegas, New Mexico during that time. In the 1900 census, Isadora Miller says she has no living children, but in the 1910 census, she said she had two, one that was still living, and. She could have been uh, the uh, she could have been talking about Max, except the census asked the questions: How many children were born, and then how many are living? And in 1900, well after they adopted Max, she had no living children. And then in 1910, she had two that were born and one that was alive. She states her date of birth in 1900 is 1849. <laughs> But in the 1910 census, it's 1852. Okay. Uh, so Isadora Saiz, S-A-I-Z, which would be the, the proper uh, Spanish uh, spelling of the name, according to the uh, New Mexico Hispanic Genealogical Research Center, was born in 1849. On May 25th, 1867, so at the age of 18, she marries Jose Pedro Padilla in San Jose Church, Anton Chico, New Mexico. Her father was Manuel Antonio Saez and her mother, Maria Marcelena Gutierrez. She had an older brother, Juan Saez, and an older sister, Maria Dolores Saez. My mom's name is Dolores. Sometime before February 10, 1868, 
So she's married uh, less than a year. Her son, has Jose Padilla Padilla, yes, he had the same middle and last name, was born. A year later, before February 10th, 1869, her daughter Maria Antonia Padilla was born. They christened both children in the same church in Anton Chico, New Mexico. Now, uh, this would be a good time to talk about Anton Chico. I have to get back to that page. So Anton Chico still exists? Yes. Um, the uh, 1822, New Mexico creates the Anton Chico land grant, about 400,000 acres. Salvador Tapia and 36 others petition the government for the grant, and uh, they, they start uh, settling the land. Indian raids uh, have them abandon the settlement in 1827, but in 1834, Anton Chico is resettled, and it sticks this time. The uh, population of Anton Chico at that point is 100, I just had it here, I lost it, so I'm sorry, my apologies. Uh, 1841 to 42, there's a population of two to 300 people built around a plaza designed for defense. Uh, in 1890, now this is a good nine years after the Billy the Kid was killed or not, uh, it reaches a population of roughly 900 people, all Hispanic. Uh, mercantile center for much of eastern New Mexico. Uh, as people migrated out of the area into more populous areas, which would be Albuquerque, Santa Fe, uh, uh, Amarillo, etc., uh, the population drops. But 900 in 19 or 1890 in 1881 1878 we don't know somewhere between 200 and 900 keep that in mind as we go forward okay okay uh at some point so uh, by february 10th maria antonia padilla was born second child of isadora Saez, and the, both of those kids are uh, christened in the church in Anton Chico. At some point over the next three years, uh, both her husband and her son uh, die. Jose Pedro and Jose Padilla both die. No reason why, no death certificate found. So January fourth, eighteen uh, January fourteenth, eighteen seventy. Now twenty one years old. She becomes uh, she uh, marries Cesario Gorule in the same church in Anton Chico, New Mexico. Same time, Cesario adopted Isidora's daughter, and she became Maria Antonia Gorule, shortened to Antonia Gorule. She is two years old. So, if this is the correct Isadora, and it might not be, but there's a good chance that it is based on John Miller giving her proper surname and place of birth, she's married twice before she ever meets Miller. Both Miller and John Miller and Isadora say they were married in 1886 and married for 14 years. That's in the 1990 census, or eight, <laughs> 1990. That's in the uh, 1900 census, I'm sorry. So in, in the official census, they don't say they were married in 1881. They don't say they were married by Father Berrera. Those are all hearsay things handed down. They say they were married in 1886, and if true, then uh, what happened to Isadora's daughter? Well, by that point, she would have been, Isadora would have been already, or uh, her daughter would have been already 17, 18 years old. So maybe old enough to be on her own, maybe marrying off, 
maybe staying with the stepfather. No one knows 100% for sure. But what we do know is that if Isadora is born in 1849, she's at least 10 years older and maybe more than John Miller. Why did she run off with him? Were they ever married? Is she Isadora size? But here's the thing that struck my um, imagination. She's from Las Vegas, but that she's married. Her kids are baptized in Anton Chico, which is a tiny little settlement that exists today. In the time of the uh, formative stages of the Lincoln County War, Anton Chico has a couple hundred, maybe a few more people, mostly Hispanic families, including the Saez family. If you go back to Paulita Maxwell's interview with Walter Noble Burns, and she talks about that there were these bias dances in uh, Fort Sumner and pretty girls from all over the territory, uh, you know, all the, all the towns came and she mentions Anton Chico. And they were very vain of Billy the Kid's att in, uh, attentions. And uh, everybody, you know, uh, all these pretty girls wanted to dance with him. And he cut a fine figure, well-dressed, neat, polite. Well, you could, uh, you could uh, ascertain a few things from that. If we're talking about 1878 or so, now we're talking about an Isadora Sias or Padilla, because she's married by married the second time by that point. Uh, oh, actually, I guess she wouldn't be Padilla if it was the second time she was married to uh, my apologies, <laughs> uh, Cesario Garule. So she's and she's uh, Isadora Garule, and she. Uh, she marries him in 1870, but by 1878, 79, 80, maybe she's growing tired of the married life. Maybe Cesario was a good stepfather to her daughter, but maybe he was boring. Maybe he wasn't a good provider. Maybe he had another woman. Maybe anything. And maybe 20, at this point now, 49, so seven, you know, now a almost 30, 29 year old uh, Isadora decides, hey, I need to have a little fun. All I want to do is have some fun. <clears throat> and she decides to head down to some of the dances in Fort Sumner. And there she meets a dashing young man known as William H. Bonney. Uh, it'll never be proven, nor will it ever be disproven. But clearly, based on Paulita Maxwell's interview and testimony, uh, pretty girls from all over the area would go down to these dances. Fort Sumner was kind of the hub, and they would, you know, and and one of the one of the attractions was Billy Bonney, this young man. So. Isadora maybe becomes fascinated. You might be thinking, listening to this and going, hey, well, then maybe John Miller was Billy the Kid. Maybe she uh, she absolutely did in those times when she's 29 years old and worldly and experienced and Billy's, you know, kind of a younger guy. Maybe she, maybe he became fascinated with her so much that he decided to run off with her. Well, sure, you will never unprove that. You will never prove that not to be true. But my theory is that Isadora, amongst all of the other women who were very vain of Billy's attentions, did go to Fort Sumner, probably met him, maybe danced with him. I bet you they traded, who are you? Where are you from? Anton Chico. Yeah, I haven't been there in a long time. Pat Garrett's out to get me. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. And she probably thought, man, this is a good looking guy, but he's a young kid and uh, I need a little more stability. And at some point she meets whoever John Miller was, but she's been around Billy the Kid enough to know. She uh, understands the excitement that goes on around his name. She lived in that environment and she spends the rest of her life proclaiming that her man 
is the real Billy the Kid. And she absolutely did, by all account, tell she believed and told people that he was Billy the Kid, even when he did not. I would say it's at least very possible that Isadora Saez met William Bonney at some point in their lives, even if it was in some passing sort of way, it's likely that they met. And what happened after that is up for conjecture. Conjecture. Unless it isn't. We'll be right back. Well, we've done a fairly deep dive into the life and times of John Miller. Uh, you may have uh, developed your own uh, assessment of whether he was or was not Billy the Kid by now. Um, and Dr. Tunnell, in Chapter 9 of his book, Imposter Unmasked, has done the same. So I'm going to uh, summarize this very shortly for you. Uh, and this is directly from the book. When I described Billy the Kid's anatomy earlier, I drew your attention to several features based on scientific research. Unambiguously, I described the uniqueness of Billy's anatomy. These include ears, ptosis of the eyelids, spelled P-T-O-S-I-S, asymmetric features of the face, protrusion of the upper teeth in a small mouth, arching of his eyebrows, rounding and sloping shoulders. And then it continues, when one compares the tintype photograph of Billy the Kid to pictures of John Miller, none of these features match. I will repeat, none of these features match. Now, you can go to your photo analysis. You can, uh, you know, retouch your photos in Photoshop. You can do uh, a bunch of uh, different things. And uh, there's a lot of forensic evidence in this book um, that uh, will, you know, really open up your mind, uh, including Max Miller talking about that uh, his father moved to the hot springs near Buckeye because of his rheumatism, uh, arthritis. And uh, you can, and during the exhumation, they looked for, uh, you know, uh, uh, evidence of that. But again, I'm not going to go through all of that stuff. If you look at the picture of John Miller, about 50 years old, and he looks way, way older than 50. This is uh, uh, reprinted in this book with permission from Anita Liston, who's the daughter and heir to the original owner, Jewel Crockett Lamson. And so the copyright for the photo is owned by Anita Liston. Um, John Miller looks really old at 50 years old. I mean, I'm 58 and John Miller looks like he could be my grandfather. He certainly could be my father who had me late in life. So this guy had a tough life. He calls into question Brushy Bill, who said he was 90 and looked like he was 60, but that's an aside. That's for another day. Uh, the one thing that you look at and you can see uh, pretty quickly is that John Miller, while thin and probably a hardworking man and had to, you know, and lived a, a pretty tough life, uh, had very square shoulders had a very square jaw. Now the shape of the jaw can change if teeth are removed. So uh, you don't, you don't need to just go by that. But the square shoulders, you know, that the, the picture of Billy the kid in front of Beaver Smith's saloon, most likely taken, most likely in 1879 or early 1880, shows uh, a young man with dramatically rounded and sloping shoulders, right? Uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's like a jacket would, <laughs> would fall off of him. If he put both arms down, it would just slide off and, and relatively wide hips. It's just a body type. Okay. It's not a fashion statement. When you look at John Miller, you can see that John Miller has very square, you know, uh, erect shoulders, keep your mind out of the gutter. And that body type really looks nothing like Billy Bonney. Uh, that uh, if the picture of Billy is taken at about 20 years old, he's pretty much near the end of his growth cycle. You know, his bones have 
uh, you know, taken shape and fused in the position they're going to be. Certainly, there's not going to be a dramatic shift from those sloping shoulders where the arms, you know, hang lower to very square, strong shoulders. Now, musculature, musculature can certainly change the shape or appearance of the body. Uh, but Miller in this photograph is very, very thin. Again, I, I you know, he was not a wealthy guy. He wasn't sitting home eating bonbons or having a, uh, a Reuben sandwich and a chocolate malt every night. Uh, so I don't, I don't know that you could look at this and go, oh, it's the, it's the, um, the muscles that make him look, you know, different than Billy. Um, it just doesn't seem to be the same. Uh, so that the, uh, the, you know, the facial features, the square chin, again, dental work could impact that, but could it change it? Absolutely so much. Uh, you know, the shape of the eyes, the ears, all those things, the ears tell the story, uh, you know, all, all the way along. Um, it's, it's very, very likely in the highest 90 something degree percentile that you can exclude John Miller as being Billy the Kid. You can include John Miller as having a really cool story. And you can include John Miller as being a guy who successfully hid his uh, origins up until whenever he appeared in Rama, New Mexico, which could have been, uh, you know, as late as the uh, 1890s. Uh, you know, coming up on 1900 when he signed that agreement with Jesus Ariacho, uh, he was kind of a mystery man. You could credit his wife Isadora, maybe Isadora Size, with having met, maybe even known Billy the Kid in her trips from Anton Chico to Fort Sumner to attend some of the lively dances. You could wonder what happened to Isadora's daughter, who was uh, adopted by her second husband, Cesario Gurule, Gurule <laughs> and, uh, and try to track her down and see if there's any family connection there. But it's clear that Isadora and John did not tote a, a young lady, you know, an 18 year old lady around the West with them and simply moved on with their life. So you can you can uh, believe in the story of the mystery trunk that with the contents proved that this guy was Billy the Kid, except what could be in the trunk that would prove that other than a picture like taken three seconds after the, the original picture of Billy the Kid, and now he's standing there with his arm around Pat Garrett or something like that, and He's got a name tag on that says John Miller or something. And of course, all of the evidence points to the fact that there, after the fire in 1836, where Isidore died, there was no trunk. There certainly was no trunk at his final resting place. He didn't have a storage facility. You store it, we lock it, or, you know, he didn't have anything like that. There's zero record of that trunk anywhere, anywhere in an exhaustive search of records throughout Arizona probate court, sheriff's department. There is nothing that says that that trunk existed after 1936, nor that there was anything in it. It's all made up. That's, that's the point. It's all made up. It was made up by somebody. Who made it up? That's up to you to figure out. I don't, uh, I think Helen Airy did a fine job of presenting a, hey, this could be true type of situation. And here's the evidence or here's the testimony, um, very little evidence. But she never definitively declared that John Miller was Billy the Kid. And it's good because John Miller was not Billy the Kid. John Miller existed at a time when he could have been Billy the Kid, when his age was appropriate for someone that could have been William H. Bonney. But the physical similarities are not there. He's just an old man in his picture that doesn't really look anything at all like William H. Bonney, other than being an old man in the West. 
and there were millions of those. And John Miller himself denied being Billy the Kid, at least according to people who say they knew him at the time. John Miller's physical characteristics from the forensic examination, the exhumation did not point to any wounds whatsoever, none, zero, that would uh, point to him being Billy the Kid. And in fact, if you look at the picture, if you can find it online of John Miller's mandible, his upper jaw with the teeth, you can see that his two front teeth are still intact and they're pushed, or at least one of them, and they're pushed inward. They're inward. They're not bucked out and they don't have that, that V shape that would push the lip out. They're actually going inward. So I'm comfortable saying that John Miller was not, unequivocally not, Billy the Kid. And it's probably too late at this late date. And, and with the research that's gone on, you, you, know, you would want to, I, I, I would love to know who John Miller was. Where did he come from? What happened up until he married Isadora and they showed up? Did John Miller know Billy the Kid? Did he go by another name? And did he ride with, have any interaction with Billy the Kid? Was he one of Billy's you know, uh, unnamed pals who went to a dance with him in Fort Sumner in 1878 or 79. And Billy said, hey, check her out. She's a little older, but she's cute. And John Miller said to Billy, well, you know, she probably likes you. And Billy goes, hey, look, I'm busy with Celsa, DeLuvina, Abrana, Paulita. You can have her. I think her name's Isadora. Go and dance with her. Did that happen? I mean, I, I don't know. But it could have been. John Miller existed at the time that he could have known, could have had interaction with Billy the Kid. Isadora size slash Miller absolutely positively existed at the time and in the geographic area where she could have known Billy the Kid and would have course to have run into him should she, along with a bunch of other little pretty ladies, uh, travel to Fort Sumner for their regular dances. But was John Miller Billy? Was Isadora the wife of Billy the Kid? No. No. And there doesn't even seem to be any sense in continuing to search for information that would prove it to be true since there's essentially zero chance that he is based on the physical forensic evidence. But I really would love to know who he was. And I think the more fascinating character in the entire story is Isadora. And what she knew and what her life was like and how she wound up in that house in 1836 and all the things that she'd gone through to get there. Max Miller believed his father to be Billy the Kid, but believing something and being able to prove something or having any real tangible evidence that something's true are two very different things. The mystery trunk is long since gone and probably never existed after the house fire of 1936. And the gun that's supposedly owned by some collector in Canada will show us the gun. What kind of gun did Billy carry that had 21 notches on it? One, what, three for every person he killed? Doesn't even make sense. More urban legend. So, that is our story of John Miller, who is uh, destined to be in respectfully put upon the scrap heap of Billy the Kid imposters. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the episode and found some enlightenment. Again, the book, Resurrecting the Dead, we now know more about Billy the Kid, the person, than the legend, by Dr. Dale Tunnell, the Western Legends Research Book Number One. Um, I highly recommend, there's way, way more in the book than this, and, and goes into a lot of the uh, analysis of Billy based on his letters and, and those kind of things to Governor Wallace. Uh, really fascinating stuff. And as you would expect for a, a true history book, well-researched, footnoted, etc. If you're reading a history book that doesn't show its sources and doesn't footnote any of those sources, there's no bibliography, you're reading a novel.
that's the way it works. Okay. All right. So uh, what about Brushy? Go watch the final trial of Billy the Kid on Amazon Prime. I, I don't know. It's it's not Prime because you can't stream it for free on with, with a Prime membership. Amazon just doesn't take indie films for that. If you go and watch it and review it often enough, it could make the jump to that at some point in the future. Or it could wind up on Amazon's freebie service, which is the old IMDb TV, where you can watch it with ads. So if you want to see that happen, go watch the film. Go rent it. It's it's a couple bucks, two or three bucks to rent. Watch the film, enjoy it, rate and review it. I don't care what you say. You tell, tell me it's the worst film you ever saw, then if that's what it is, that's what it is. If it's the best film you ever saw, which it probably will be, <laughs> then write that down. Okay, but go do that. Help uh, help the film reach a wider audience, and you can get some answers as to Brushy Bill, Pat Garrett, the holes in all of their stories on the final trial of Billy the Kid. If you're international, last time I checked, Amazon was only the U.S. and U.K., although it will be in other territories. But if you're Canada, if you're Germany, if you're Japan, if you're South America, if you're anywhere else, Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O dot com, search for the final trial of Billy the Kid. You can rent, buy, stream it right now. Go do that. John Miller, we loved you. Uh, we'd like to know you, love to interview you and uh, find out what you know about Billy the Kid because you clearly were not him, but you were someone. Until next time, everybody, it's Michael G. for all things Billy.